Chapter 30 from Timby Fundamentals, Urinary Elimination. Learning Objectives. Identify the functions of the urinary system. Describe the physical characteristics of urine and factors that affect urination. Name four types of urine specimens that nurses commonly collect. Identify three alternative devices for urinary elimination. Define continence training. Name three types of urinary catheters. Describe two principles that apply to using a closed drainage system. Explain why catheter care is important in the nursing management of clients with retention catheters. Discuss the purpose for irrigating a catheter and methods for performing this skill. Define urinary diversion. Discuss factors that contribute to impaired skin integrity in clients with a urostomy. Overview of urinary elimination. The urinary system is made up of the kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra. These major components, along with some accessory structures such as the ring-shaped muscles called the internal and external sphincters, work together to produce urine, which is fluid within the bladder, collect it, and excrete it from the body. Urinary elimination, the process of releasing excess fluid in metabolic waste or urination, occurs when urine is excreted. Under normal conditions, the average person eliminates about 1,500 to 3,000 milliliters of urine each day. The consequences of impaired urinary elimination can be life-threatening. Urination takes place several times each day. The need to urinate becomes apparent when the bladder distends with approximately 150 to 300 milliliters of urine. The distension with urine causes increased fluid pressure stimulating stretch receptors in the bladder wall and creating a desire to empty it of urine. Question, is the following statement true or false? Kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra, along with the internal and external sphincters, work together to produce urine, collect it, and excrete it from the body. True. Kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra, along with internal and external sphincters, work together to produce urine, collect it, and excrete it from the body. Characteristics of urine, table 30-1. Volume, the normal volume is 500 to 3,000 milliliters per day, 1,200 milliliters per day on average. Abnormal would be less than 400 milliliters per day. Common causes are low fluid intake, excess fluid loss, kidney dysfunction, and high fluid intake if it's greater than 3,000 milliliters per day, high fluid intake, diuretic medications, endocrine diseases, and dehydration would be evidenced by color being light yellow, dark amber is abnormal, dehydration is indicated with the dark amber color, Brown means liver or gallbladder disease. Reddish brown is blood. Orange, green, or blue, water-soluble dyes are in the urine. Cloudy means infection. Clarity usually is transparent. If it's cloudy, that's abnormal. That, again, means infection and stasis, meaning the urine is just sitting. It's not getting excreted, so bacteria are growing. Odor, it should be faintly aromatic normally. Abnormal is foul and strong and pungent odor. Um, the reason for this is infection, dehydration, and certain foods can cause this. Characteristics of urine. The physical characteristics of urine include its volume, its color, clarity, and odor. Factors affecting urinary elimination. Patterns of urinary elimination depend on physiologic, emotional, and social factors such as 1. the degree of neuromuscular development and the integrity of the spinal cord, 2. the volume of fluid intake and the amount of fluid losses, including those from other sources, 3. the amount and type of food consumed, 4. the person's circadian rhythms, habits, opportunities for urination, and anxiety. General measures to promote urination include providing privacy, assuming a natural position for urination, which is sitting for women, standing for men, maintaining an adequate fluid intake and using stimuli such as running water from a tap to initiate voiding. Overview of urinary elimination. Patterns of urinary elimination include physiologic 
reasons, emotional reasons, and social reasons for any abnormalities. Uh, social examples are the amount of food consumed, um, the volume of fluid intake, and the amount of fluid losses. Measures to promote urination. Providing privacy, assuming a natural position for urination, which is sitting for women, standing for men, maintaining an adequate fluid intake, and using stimuli such as running water from a tap to initiate voiding. Factors that affect urination. Degree of neuromuscular development, the integrity of the spinal cord, volume of fluid intake and fluid losses, the amount and type of food consumed, circadian rhythms, habits, opportunities for urination, and anxiety. Urine specimen collection. The purpose is to identify microscopic or chemical constituents. Common urine specimens that nurses collect include voided specimens, clean catch specimens, catheter specimens, and 24-hour specimens. Clean catch is also known, known as midstream because of how it is collected. Voided specimens is a sample of fresh urine collected in a clean container. The first voided specimen of the day is preferred because it's most likely to contain substantial urinary components that have accumulated during the night. The specimen can be voided and collected at any time though it is needed. The sample of urine is transferred into a specimen container and delivered to a lab for testing and analysis as soon as possible. If the specimen cannot be examined in less than an hour after collection, it is labeled and refrigerated. Clean catch specimens is a voided sample of urine considered sterile and is sometimes called a midstream specimen because of the way it's collected. To avoid contaminated the voided sample with microorganisms or substances other than those in the urine, the external structures through which the urine passes, the urinary meatus, which is the opening in the urethra, and the surrounding tissues are cleansed. The urine is collected after the initial stream has been released. Clean catch specimens are preferred to randomly voided specimens. This method of collection is also prefer preferable when a urine specimen is needed during a woman's menstrual period. As soon as the specimen is collected, it is labeled and taken to the lab. A clean catch urine specimen is refrigerated if the analysis will be delayed more than one hour. Research suggests that collecting a specimen in midstream after the use of soap, tap water, and non-sterile gauze for perineal cleansing provides results as reliable and in some cases more so than when an antiseptic solution is used because even a small amount of antiseptic can reduce the bacterial count when the culture is ordered. Nurses should follow their agency's policy for collecting midstream voided specimens. When a clean catch specimen is needed, nurses can instruct clients who are capable of performing the procedure on the collection technique. However, the quality of the results is only as good as the quality of the specimen, making this technique for collection mandatory to the reliability of the results. Catheter specimens. A urine specimen can be collected under sterile conditions using a catheter, but this is usually done when clients are catheterized for other reasons such as to control incontinence in an unconscious client. Clean catch midstream specimens are a lower cost alternative to catheterized specimens because of the reduced incidence of cellular and microbial contamination. For clients who are already catheterized, the nurse clamps the drainage tube for 30 minutes and then aspirates or pulls back on a syringe after cleansing the port with alcohol and aspirates a small amount of urine into the um, syringe. 24-hour specimens. The nurse collects, labels, and delivers a 24-hour specimen, a collection of all urine produced in the full 24-hour period, to the lab for analysis. Because the contents in urine decompose over time, the nurse places the collected urine in a container with a chemical preservative or puts the container in a basin of ice or in a specimen dedicated refrigerator. To establish the 24-hour collection period accurately, the nurse instructs the client to urinate just before starting the test and then discard that urine. All urine voided thereafter becomes part of the collected specimen. Exactly 24 hours later, the nurse asks the client to void one last time to complete the test collection. The final urination in all collected voidings from the preceding 24 hours represents the total specimen, which the nurse labels and takes to the lab. Client family teaching, collecting a clean 
catch specimen. The nurse teaches the female client as follows. Wash your hands, remove the lid from the specimen container without touching the inside of the container's lid. This is a sterile cup. Rest the lid upside down on its outer surface, taking care not to touch the inside. Sit on the toilet and spread your legs. Separate your labia with your fingers. Cleanse each side of the urinary meatus with a separate swab, wiping from front to back toward the vagina. Use the final clean, moistened swab to wipe directly down the center of the separated tissue. So usually there's three wipes that you get, one for the right side of the labia, one for the left, and one down the middle. And that would be the last wipe. Sit on the toilet, spread your legs, separate your labia, cleanse each side, use the facial or the final clean moistened swab to wipe directly down, begin to urinate. After releasing a small amount of urine into the toilet, catch a sample of urine in the specimen container. Do not touch the mouth of the specimen container to your skin. Place the specimen container nearby in a flat surface. Release your fingers and continue voiding normally. Wash your hands, cover the specimen container with the lid. The male client should follow the same steps, but should perform the following cleansing routine. Retract your foreskin if you are uncircumcised or cleanse in a circular direction around the tip of the penis toward its base using a pre-moistened swab. Repeat with another swab. Continue retracting the foreskin while initiating the first release of urine and until you have collected the midstream specimen. Identifying abnormal elimination patterns. Laboratory analysis is a valuable diagnostic tool for identifying abnormal characteristics of urine. Specific terms describe particular abnormal characteristics of urine and urination. Many terms use the suffix urea, U-R-I-A, which refers to urine or urination. Some definitions. Hematuria is urine containing blood. High urea is urine, urine containing pus. Protein urea is urine containing plasma proteins. Albumin in urea is urine containing albumin, a plasma protein. Glycosuria is urine containing glucose, and ketone urea is urine containing ketones. High urea is urine containing pus. Protein urea is urine containing plasma proteins, glycosuria is urine containing glucose, and ketone urea is urine containing ketones. Abnormal elimination patterns. Assessment findings may indicate abnormal patterns of urinary elimination. Some common problems include anuria, oliguria, polyuria, nocturia, dysuria, and incontinence. Anuria means the absence of urine or a volume of 100 milliliters or less in 24 hours. It indicates that the kidneys are not forming sufficient urine. In this case, the term urinary suppression is used. In urinary suppression, the bladder is empty. Therefore, the client feels no urge to urinate. This distinguishes anuria from urinary retention in which the client produces urine but does not release it from the bladder. A sign of urinary retention is progressively distending bladder and usually pain and pressure. Oliguria, urine output less than 400 milliliters per 24 hours indicates the inadequate elimination of urine. Sometimes oliguria is a sign that the bladder is being only partially emptied during voidings. Residual urine or more than 50 milliliters of urine that remains in the bladder after voiding can support the growth of microorganisms leading to infection. Also, when there is urinary stasis, meaning it's sitting, lack of movement, dissolved substances such as calcium can precipitate, leading to urinary stones. So if the urine is sitting, it leads to urinary stones. Oliguria, again, is urine output less than 400 milliliters per 24 hours, indicates inadequate elimination of urine. Residual urine is more than 50 milliliters of urine remains in the bladder after voiding. Urinary stasis is lack of movement of urine from the bladder. Older adults are more likely to have chronic residual urine, excessive urine in the bladder after urinating, which increases the risk for urine, urinary tract infections. Maintenance of good perineal hygiene is one intervention for preventing urinary tract infections. Women should always clean from the urinary area back toward the rectal area to prevent organisms from the stool entering the bladder. In addition, thorough hand washing by the client and caregiver is necessary. 
Also, older adults may benefit from learning double voiding in which the person voids, then waits a few more minutes to allow any residual urine to be voided. This facilitates emptying the bladder. Polyuria means greater than normal urinary elimination and may accompany a minor dietary variation. For example, consuming higher than normal amounts of fluids, especially those with mild diuretic effects such as coffee and tea, or taking certain meds actually can increase urination. Ordinarily, urine output is nearly equal to fluid intake. When the cause of polyuria is not apparent, excessive urination may be the result of a disorder. Common disorders associated with polyuria include diabetes mellitus, an endocrine disorder caused by insufficient insulin or insulin resistance, and diabetes insipidus, an endocrine disease caused by insufficient antidiuretic hormone. Nocturia. Nighttime urination is, is unusual because the rate of urine production is normally reduced at night. Consequently, nocturia suggests an underlying medical problem. In aging men, an enlarging prostate gland which encircles the urethra interferes with complete bladder emptying. As a result, there is a need to urinate more frequently, including during the usual hours of sleep. Nurses who are pregnant or may become pregnant should not handle crushed or broken finasteride, which is the drug Proscar or Propecia, or Dutacericide, which is Ativart, capsules or tablets. Absorption of this drug poses substantial risk for abnormal growth to a male fetus. Dysuria. Dysuria is the difficult or uncomfortable voiding and a common symptom of trauma to the urethra or a bladder infection. Frequency, the need to urinate often, and urgency, a strong feeling that urine must be eliminated quickly, often accompanies dysuria, which is pain when you urinate. Older adults are likely to experience urinary urgency and frequency because of normal physiologic changes such as diminished bladder capacity and degenerative changes in the cerebral cortex. Subsequently, when they perceive the urge to void, they need to access the bathroom as soon as possible. Age-related changes such as diminished bladder capacity and a relaxation of the pelvic floor muscle tone increase the risk for incontinence. Fluid restriction may be used in an attempt to control urination, but it may actually contribute to incontinence by causing concentrated urine and eliminating the normal perception of a full bladder. Nutrition notes. Observational studies suggest that pro Anthrocyanidins in cranberries may decrease the incidence of recurring urinary tract infections, possibly by impairing the ability of bacteria to stick to the lining of the urinary tract. However, placebo-controlled trials have failed to confirm a decrease in UTIs related to cranberries. Problems with assessing cranberry efficacy include the difficulty in standardizing dosing because cranberry is available in various forms such as juice, capsules, tablets, and extract. Incontinence. Incontinence means the ability to inability to control either urinary or bowel elimination and is abnormal after a person has achieved earlier continence. The term urinary incontinence should not be used indiscriminately. Anyone may be incontinent if his or her need for assistance goes unnoticed. Once the bladder becomes extremely distended, spontaneous urination may be more of a personal problem than a client problem. The client may, be, may not be incontinent if staff members are attentive to his or her need to urinate. Drug therapy. Drug therapy can increase the risk for urinary incontinence, especially in older adults when cognitive mobility issues hamper the ability to void in a timely manner. Drugs that increase urinary incontinence include the following. High blood pressure drugs. They vasodilate and put more fluid into the vascular system. Antidepressants impair bladder contraction and worsen overflow incontinence sy symptoms. Diuretics, water pills, push excess water and salt into the bladder. Sleeping pills, clients do not respond and waken to void with a full bladder at night. Client care includes more frequent voiding, especially within two hours of diuretic administration. Which abnormal urinary elimination pattern is characterized by a greater than normal urinary volume accomplished by accompanied by minor dietary variations. Is it A, polyuria, B, oliguria, C, dysuria, or D, hematuria? Answer is A, polyuria. Polyuria is an abnormal urinary elimination pattern in which greater than normal urinary volume accompanies minor dietary variations. Oliguria is urine output less than 
400 mils per 24 hours. Dysuria means pain with voiding and is a common symptom of trauma to the urethra or UTI. Hematuria means urine containing blood. Assisting the client with urinary elimination. Stable clients who can ambulate are assisted to the bathroom to use the toilet. Clients who are weak or cannot walk to the bathroom may need a commode, a bedside toilet. Clients confined to the bed use a urinal or bedpan. Commode. It's a chair with an opening in the seat under which a receptacle is placed to catch the, the urine or stool, and it's located beside or near the bed. It is used for eliminating urine or stool. Immediately afterward, the waste container is removed, emptied, cleaned, and replaced. The urinal is a cylindrical container for collecting urine. It is more easily used by males. When given to the client, the urinal should be empty, otherwise the bed linen may become wet and soiled. If the client needs help placing the urinal, pull the privacy curtain, put on gloves, ask the client to spread his legs, hold the urinal by its handle, direct the urinal at an angle between the client's legs so that the bottom rests on the bed. Lift the penis and place it well within the urinal. Urinal. Urinal is a cylindrical container for collecting urine. It's more easily used by males. When given to the client, the urinal should be empty. Otherwise, the bed linen may become wet and soiled. If the client needs help placing the urinal, pull the privacy curtain, put on gloves, ask the client to spread his legs, hold the urinal by its handle, direct the urinal at an angle between the client's legs so that the bottom of it rests on the bed, lift the penis, and place it well within the urinal. After use, the nurse promptly empties the urinal. He or she measures and records the volume of urine if the client's intake and output are being monitored. The nurse washes his or her hands and always offers the client an opportunity to wash his hands after voiding. Using a bedpan. A bedpan is a seat-like container for elimination. It's used to collect urine or stool. Most bedpans are made of plastic and are several inches deep. A fracture pan, a modified version of a conventional bedpan, is flat on the sitting end rather than rounded. See page 699 for pictures. Clients with musculoskeletal disorders who cannot elevate their hips and sit on a bedpan in the usual manner use a fracture pan. When a client confides to bed, feels the need to eliminate, the nurse places a bedpan under the buttocks. See skill 30-1. Types of incontinence, table 30-2, page 700, and Timby Fundamentals. There's stress incontinence, urge incontinence, reflex, functional, total, and overflow. Stress incontinence is the loss of small amounts of urine when intra-abdominal pressure rises. An example would be dribbling is associated with sneezing, coughing, lifting, laughing, or rising from a bed or chair. Causes, loss of perineal and sphincter muscle tone, secondary to childbirth, menopausal atrophy, prolapsed uterus, or obesity. Nursing approach, pelvic floor muscle strengthening, called Kegels, and weight reduction. Urge incontinence is the need to void, perceived frequently with short-lived ability to sustain control of the flow. Example is voiding commences when there is a delay in accessing a toilet. Common causes, bladder irritation secondary to infection, loss of bladder tone from recent continuous drainage with an indwelling catheter. Nursing approach, restriction of fluid intake of at least 2,000 milliliters per day, omit bladder, ir bladder irritants such as caffeine or alcohol, administration of diuretics in the morning is what you want. You don't want to give diuretics at night because people have to get up and go in the bath to the bathroom in the night urgently. Reflex incontinence is spontaneous loss of urine when the bladder is stretched with urine but without prior perception of a need to void. The person automatically releases urine and cannot control it. Damage to motor and sensory tracts in the lower spinal cord, secondary to trauma, a tumor, or other neurological conditions is the cause. Nursing approach is cutaneous triggering, straight intermittent catheterization helps. Functional incontinence is control 
over urination is lost because of inaccessibility of a toilet or a compromised ability to use one. Voiding occurs while attempting to overcome barriers such as doorways, transferring from a wheelchair, manipulating clothing, acquiring assistance, or making needs known. Common causes is impaired mobility, impaired cognition, physical restraints, and inability to communicate. Nursing approach is clothing modification, access to a toilet, commode, or urine, close by, assistance to a toilet, according to a pre-planned schedule. Total incontinence is loss of urine without any identifiable pattern or warning. The person passes urine without any ability or effort to control due to altered consciousness, secondary to a head injury, loss of sphincter tone, secondary to prostatectomy, anatomic leak through a urethral vaginal fistula. Nursing approach is absorbent undergarments, an external catheter, or an indwelling catheter. Overflow incontinence is urine leakage because the bladder is not completely emptied. Bladder dis is distended with retained urine. An example would be the person voids small amounts frequently or urine leaks around a catheter. This is due to an overstretched bladder or weakened muscle tone secondary to obstruction of the urethra by debris within a catheter, an enlarged prostate, distended bowel, or post-operative bladder spasms. Nursing approach is hydration, adequate bowel elimination, patency of catheter, and crede maneuver. Managing incontinence. Urinary incontinence, depending on its type, may be permanent or temporary. The six types of urinary incontinence are stress, urge, reflex, functional, total, and overflow. The management of incontinence is complex because there's so many different types. Treatment is further complicated when clients have more than one type of incontinence. For example, stress incontinence often accompanies urge incontinence. Some forms of incontinence respond to simple measures such as modifying clothing to make elimination easier. Other forms improve only with a more regimented approach like continence training. Inserting a retention catheter is the least desirable approach to managing the incontinence because it is the leading cause of urinary tract infections in hospitals and nursing homes. Gerontologic considerations. Loss or control over urination often threatens an older adult's independence and self-esteem. It may also cause an older adult to restrict activities possibly contributing to depression. Teaching older adults to structure activities with planned toileting breaks every 60 to 90 minutes results in less urine in the bladder and thus diminishes urge incontinence. Older adults who experience difficulty controlling urine need an evaluation to identify and treat contributing factors such as constipation, urinary tract infection, and side effects from medications. Older adults need encouragement to discuss urinary incontinence with a knowledgeable, non-judgmental health care provider. If they understand that urinary incontinence is a condition that frequently responds to medication or behavioral training, they are more likely to seek professional help. Many sources are available to assist older adults in evaluation and treating incontinence. For example, some health care facilities offer special incontinence clinics and physical therapy departments teach pelvic muscle exercises. The National Association for Continence is an excellent source of information for products, resources, and continence programs. So this is www.nafc.org. Nurses can encourage older adults to take advantage of these kinds of resources rather than accepting incontinence as an inevitable condition that compromises their quality of life. When efforts to restore continence are unsuccessful, nurses can encourage older adults to verbalize their feelings and identify interventions helpful in maintaining dignity, ultimately enabling older adults to participate in meaningful activities. Continence training. Continence training to restore the control of urination involves teaching the client to refrain from urinating until an appropriate time and place. This process sometimes is referred to as bladder retraining, but this term is inaccurate because the various techniques used involve mechanisms other than those unique to the bladder. Continence training primarily benefits clients with the cognitive ability and desire to participate in a rehab program. This includes clients with lower body paralysis who wish to facilitate urination without the use of urinary drainage devices such as catheters. Clients who are candidates for continence training require alternative methods such as absorbent undergarments. Continence training is often a slow process that requires the combined effort and dedication of the nursing team, client, and family. 
Incontinence Training, Nursing Guidelines 30-1, page 701. Compile a log of the client's urinary elimination patterns. This data helps to reveal the client's type of incontinence. Set realistic, specific, short-term goals with the client. Short-term goals prevent self-defeating consequences and promote client control. Discourage strict limitation of liquid intake. Intake maintains fluid balance and ensures adequate urine volume. So discourage strict limitation. So they want you to drink fluids. Plan a trial schedule for voiding that correlates with the times when the client is usually incontinent or experiences bladder distension. This schedule reduces the potential for accidental voidings or sustained urinary retention. In the absence of any identifiable pattern, plan to assist the client with voiding every two hours during the day and every four hours at night. This duration provides time for urine to form. Communicate the plan to nursing personnel, the client, and the family. Collaboration promotes continuity of care and dedication to reaching goals. Assist the client to a toilet or commode. Position the client on a bedpan or place a urinal just before the scheduled time for trial voiding. These measures prepare the client for releasing urine. An individualized toileting schedule should be maintained, for example, at intervals of 90 to 120 minutes for clients who have difficulty maintaining continence. Absorbent products may interfere with the person's independence in toileting and may lead to skin breakdown. Incontinence products are never used primarily for staff convenience in institutional settings. In addition, an older person should never be reprimanded for an episode of incontinence. When efforts to restore continence are unsuccessful, nurses can encourage older adults to verbalize their feelings and identify interventions helpful in maintaining dignity, ultimately enabling older persons to participate in meaningful activities. Pharmacologic considerations. Pharmacologic therapy may be an option for women with urinary incontinence. Topical estrogen, creams, or estrine vaginal ring to treat stress incontinence. Antispasmodics, oxybutynin, ditropan to treat urge incontinence. And tricyclic antidepressants such as tofranil, known as amipurbine generically, to treat mixed incontinence issues. Stimulate the sound of urination when bladder retraining, such as running water from the faucet. Doing so stimulates the, the relaxation of the sphincter muscles, allowing the release of urine. Suggest performing the crede maneuver, which is the act of bending forward and applying hand pressure over the bladder. Crede maneuver increases abdominal pressure to overcome the resistance of the internal sphincter muscle. Instruct paralyzed clients to identify any sensation that precedes voiding, such as a chill, muscular spasm, restlessness, or spontaneous penile erection. These cues can help the client anticipate urination. Suggest that paralyzed clients with reflex incontinence use cutaneous triggering, which is light massaging or tapping the skin above the pubic area. Cutaneous triggering initiates urination in clients who have, a retain, have retained avoiding reflex, the spontaneous relaxation of the urinary sphincter in response to physical stimulation. Teach clients with stress incontinence to perform pelvic floor muscle exercises, which are Kegel exercises, which are isometric exercises to improve the ability to retain urine within the bladder. See box 30-1. Pelvic floor muscle exercises, Kegels, strengthen and tone the pubo, coccygeal, and levator ani muscles used voluntarily to hold back urine and intestinal gas or stool. Assist clients with urge incontinence to walk slowly and concentrate on holding their urine when nearing the toilet. These measures reverse previous mental conditioning in which the urge to urinate becomes stronger and more overpowering close to the toilet. Box 30-1. Techniques for, perform for performing pelvic floor exercises called Kegels. Tighten the internal muscles used to prevent urination or interrupt urination once it has begun. Keep the muscles contracted for at least 10 seconds. Relax the muscles for the same period. Repeat the pattern of contraction and relaxation 10 to 25 times a day. Perform the exercise regimen three or four times a day for two weeks to one month. Catheterization. This is the act of applying or inserting a hollow. Straight catheters is a urine drainage tube inserted but not left in place. If drained, it drains urine temporarily or provides a sterile urine specimen. Retention catheters. A retention catheter is called an indwelling catheter is left in place for a period of time. The most common type is a Foley catheter. 
Unlike straight catheters, retention catheters are secured with a balloon that is inflated once the distal tip is within the bladder. Both straight and retention catheters are available in various diameters and sized according to the French F scale. For adults, size 14, 16, and 18 French are commonly used. Inserting a catheter. The technique for inserting straight and retention catheters are similar, although the steps for inflating the retention balloon do not apply to a straight catheter. When inserting a straight or retention catheter in a health agency, the nurse uses sterile technique. In the home, nurses and clients who self-catheterize use clean technique because most clients have adapted to the organisms in their own environment. Because of anatomic differences, techniques for insertion differ in men and women and are described in skills 30-3 and 30-4. Gerontologic considerations. Enlargement of the prostate, a common problem among older men, can obstruct urinary outflow and make catheterization difficult or impossible. Insertion of a urinary catheter should never be forced. Sometimes a malacot catheter is inserted into the bladder through the abdom abdominal wall, which is a suprapubic catheterization, when it cannot be inserted into a narrowed urethra. Connecting a closed drainage system. A closed drainage system, a device used to collect urine from a catheter, consists of a calibrated bag which can be opened at the bottom, tubing of sufficient length to, accom to accommodate for turning and positioning clients, and a hanger from which to suspend the bag from the bed. See fig figure 30-9. The nurse coils excessive tubing on the bed but keeps the section from the bed to the collection bag vertical. Dependent loops and the tubing interfere with gravity flow. The nurse also takes care to avoid compressing the tubing, which can obstruct drainage. Placing the tubing over the client's thigh is acceptable. The nurse always positions the drainage system lower than the bladder to avoid a black backflow of urine. When transporting the client in a wheelchair, the nurse suspends the drainage bag from the chair below the level of the bladder. When the client is ambulating, the nurse secures the drainage bag to the lower part of an IV pole or allows the client to carry the bag by hand. To reduce the potential for the drainage system becoming a reservoir of bacteria and pathogens, the entire drainage system is replaced whenever the catheter is changed and at least every two weeks in clients with urinary tract infection. Gerontologic considerations. Indwelling catheters should be avoided if at all possible because older people have increased susceptibility to urinary tract infections. Bladder training or other interventions are much more desirable. If indwelling catheters are necessary, Meticulous daily care is required. The tubing should never be placed higher than the bladder to prevent any backflow of urine into the bladder. Question, what is the appropriate indwelling catheter size for adults according to the French scale? A, 14 French, B, 12 French, C, 20 French, or D, 24 French? The answer is A, 14 French. The appropriate indwelling catheter size for adults, according to the French scale, is 14 French. Inappropriate indwelling catheter sizes for adults are 12 French, 20 French, and 24 French. In review, the closed drainage system components consist of a calibrated bag, a tubing of sufficient length, and a hanger. Catheter-associated urinary tract infections. Those who are considered at risk for acquiring urinary tract infections. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that 75% of all urinary tract infections are acquired by those with indwelling catheter, especially those that are placed in a prolonged period of time. In an effort to prevent catheter-associated urinary tract infections, the American Nurses Association has recommended measures to reduce their incidence. Advocate against inappropriate short-term catheter use. Secure the catheter appropriately. Keep the drainage bag below the level of the bladder at all times. Empty the drainage bag regularly. Keep the catheter and drainage tube from kinking. Maintain a closed drainage system. Perform perineal hygiene at least once a day. Remove urinary catheters in a timely fashion. And provide rigorous catheter care.
providing catheter care. A retention catheter keeps the meatus slightly dilated, providing pathogens with a direct pathway to the bladder where an infection could develop. Bacteria also tend to stick to the matrix of um, the urethra, forming a slimy substance known as biofilm, which supports bacterial growth and subsequent antibiotic resistance. Catheter care, hygiene measures used to keep the meatus in adjacent area of the catheter clean helps to deter and the growth and spread of colonizing pathogens. Nursing Guidelines 30-2 describes the technique for providing catheter care. Nurses must provide agency policy for using antiseptic and antimicrobial agents because the use of these substances is not a standard recommendation by the CDC. It is soap and water, rinsing and drying. Catheter irrigation. Catheter irrigation, flushing the lumen of a catheter, is a technique for restoring or maintaining catheter patency. A catheter that drains well, however, does not need to be irrigated. A generous oral fluid intake is usually sufficient to produce dilute urine, which thus keeps small shreds of mucus or tissue debris from obstructing the catheter. Occasionally, however, the catheter may need to be irrigated, such as after a surgical procedure that results in bloody urine. Depending on the type of indwelling catheter, nurses irrigate continuously through a three-way catheter or periodically using an open system or a closed system. See skill 30-5. Using an open system. An open system is one in which the retention catheter is separated from the drainage tube tubing to insert the tip of an irrigating syringe. Opening the system creates the potential for infection because it provides an opportunity for pathogens to enter the exposed connection. Consequently, it is the least desirable of the three methods. Using a closed system. A closed system is irrigated without separating the catheter from the drainage tubing. To do so, the catheter or drainage tubing must have a self-sealing port. After cleansing the port with an alcohol swab, the nurse pierces the port with an 18 or 19 gauge 1.5 inch needle. See chapter 34. He or she attaches the needle to a 30 to 60 milliliter syringe containing a sterile irrigation solution. The nurse pinches or clamps the tubing beneath the port and instills the solution then releases the tubing for drainage. The nurse records the volume of irrigant as fluid intake or subtracts it from the urine output to maintain an accurate INO record intake and output. Continuous irrigation. A continuous irrigation is the ongoing insulation of solution. It instills irrigation into a catheter by gravity over a period of days. Continuous irrigants keep a catheter patent or open after prostate or other urologic surgery in which blood clots and tissue debris collect within the bladder and catheter. A three-way catheter is necessary to provide a continuous irrigation. The catheter has three lumens or channels within the catheter, each leading to a separate port. One port connects the catheter to the drainage system, another provides a means for inflating the balloon in the catheter, and the third instills the irrigation solution. The steps involved in providing a continuous irrigation are as follows. Hang the sterile irrigating solution from an intravenous pole, purge the air from the tubing, connect the tubing to the catheter port for irrigation, regulate the rate of insulation according to the medical order, monitor the appearance of the urine and volume of urinary drainage. If you see figure 30-12, components of a three-way catheter, picture is on page 706. There's a catheter tip, inflated balloon, shows you a cross-section of the three ports, um, the irrigation port, the balloon inflammation port, and the urine drainage port. Nutrition notes. Interfering with bacterial adhesion has been shown to repel bacteria such as E. coli, a common uropathogen. Currently, cranberry products are considered a preventative measure rather than a form of treatment once a urinary tract infection exists. Providing catheter care. Plan to cleanse the meatus and nearby section of the catheter at least once a day. Regular cleansing reduces colonizing microorganisms. Gather clean gloves, soap, water, washcloth, towel, and a disposable pad. Organization facilitates sufficient time management. Wash your hands or perform an alcohol-based rub. Hand hygiene reduces the potential for transmitting microorganisms. Place a disposable pad beneath the hips of a female and beneath the penis of a male. The pad protects the bed linen from becoming wet or soiled. 
put on clean gloves and wash the meatus, the catheter where it meets the meatus, the genitalia, and the perineum in that order. So the meatus, the genitalia, and the perineum with warm soapy water. Rinse and dry. Routine hygiene removes gross secretions and transient microorganisms while following the principles of asepsis. Remove soiled materials and gloves and repeat hand hygiene measures. These steps remove colonizing microorganisms. Continuous irrigation. A continuous irrigation is the ongoing installation of solution. Indwelling catheter removal. Indwelling catheter removal. A catheter is removed when it needs to be replaced or when its use is discontinued. The best time to remove a catheter is in the morning when there is more opportunity to address any urination difficulties without depriving a client of sleep. Urinary diversion. In urinary diversion, one or more ureters are surgically implanted elsewhere. This procedure is done for various life-threatening conditions. The ureters may be brought to and through the skin of the abdomen or implanted within the bowel, called an ileal conduit. A urostomy is a urinary diversion that discharges urine from an opening on the abdomen. Care for an ostomy, a surgically created opening, is discussed in more detail in Chapter 31 because those formed for a bowel elimination are more common. Chapter 31 also provides a detailed description of an ostomy appliance, the device used for collecting stool or urine, and the manner in which it is applied and removed from the skin. Caring for a, a urostomy and changing a urinary appliance are more challenging than the care of intestinal stomas. Urine drains continuously from a urostomy, increasing the risk for skin breakdown. In addition, because moisture and the weight of the collected urine tend to loosen the appliance from the skin, a urinary appliance may need to be emptied and changed more frequently. When changing the appliance, it may be helpful to place a tampon within the stoma to absorb urine temporarily while the skin is cleansed and prepared for another appliance. It is often difficult to maintain the integrity of the peristomal skin, the skin around the stoma, because of the frequent appliance changes and the ammonia in urine. Skin barrier products are used and sometimes an antibiotic or steroid ointment is applied. Nursing implications. Clients with urinary elimination problems may have one or more of the following nursing diagnoses. Toileting, self-care deficit, impaired urinary elimination, urinary retention, risk for infection, stress urinary incontinence, urge urinary incontinence, reflex urinary incontinence, functional urinary incontinence, situational low self-esteem, risk for impaired skin integrity. Removing a Foley catheter. Wash your hands or perform an alcohol-based rub and put on clean gloves. These measures follow standard precautions. Empty the balloon by aspirating the fluid with a syringe. This step ensures that all the fluid has been withdrawn. Gently pull the catheter near the point where it exits from the meatus. Doing so facilitates withdrawal. Inspect the catheter and discard it if it appears to be intact. This ensures safety. Clean the ur urinary meatus. This promotes comfort and hygiene. Monitor the client's voiding, especially for the next 8 to 10 hours. Measure the volume of each voiding. Findings determine whether or not elimination is normal, as well as characteristics of the urine. On page 708, you can see pictures of ileal conduits, uh, ureterostomies, vasectostomies, and nephrostomies. Examples of urinary diversions. This is the end of the slideshow.